So thank you all for coming. Um, so Dr. Shuna is an assistant professor here in uh, the School of Biological and Population Health Sciences in our kinesiology program, but he also will serve as program director of the new uh, MPH option in physical activity. Um, he holds a PhD from North Dakota State University in Wellness and a master's of, or excuse me, yes, a PhD from North Dakota State University in Wellness and as well as a master's of science um, in exercise science from North Dakota State. Prior to coming to OSU in 2014, he was a postdoctoral um, researcher for ben Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Louisiana. His research program is focused on objective physical activity assessment, sedentary behavior assessment, and physical activity and sedentary behavior epidemiology. He directs the Physical Activity Epidemiology and Assessment Laboratory and is also a member of the Holly Ford Center's Healthy Eating and Active Living Corps. Um, recently, his work has focused on developing open source methods for processing and summarizing objective physical activity monitoring data with additional emphasis on automated technology interfaces and physical activity assessment. And relevant to today's discussion of the second edition of the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, Dr. Shuna is currently serving as the lead author of an in-press book chapter entitled Benefits and Risks Associated with Physical Activity from the 11th edition of the American College of Sports Medicine's Guidelines for Exercise Testing and Prescription. So please welcome Dr. Shuna. All right, I think we're live. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, in terms of uh, my title for today's talk, uh, Changes in Guidance, uh, Implications, of the Physical Activity Guidelines for American Second Edition. This is a kind of a mixture of both a little bit of science relevant to some things that we do in my lab as well. Waiting for others to join. Whoa. <laughs> well <then. laughs> as well as um, as well as a, a bit of a kind of a, a practical discussion about some changes that we've had uh, with our physical activity guidelines that have kind of shift to the landscape about how we think about measuring physical activity going forward and how we assess compliance with those guidelines. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. In terms of uh, initial disclosures, I don't have any competing interests really relevant to this talk. Uh, I will say that uh, my PhD student, um, Evan Hilberg, um, who I uh, co-advise with uh, Kathy Gunther, who's in the back, he served as an abstractor for the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, the 2018 edition review committee. <laughs> They're the scientific committee that did the comprehensive literature review upon which the guidelines that were released last November um, are based. Uh, so we have some interaction with the, the development of the guidelines, at least from the ancillary standpoint, but beyond that, no other um, disclosures or conflicts relevant to this. Okay, so in terms of where we're going to start here, uh, we do have to kind of take a step back and look at least historically about physical activity epidemiology and how that relates to the development of physical activity guidelines here in the U.S. And then from there, we'll jump forward to our current physical activity guidelines, talk about the changes that have happened with them since the previous edition, which came out a little over 10 years ago in 2008. Then we'll talk about both the, um, those changes themselves as well as the impacts that they're going to have moving forward, uh, and then where we need to go in terms of future directions for the science related to both of those things. Okay, so to begin, we probably all had some sort of background or experience uh, with the notion that physical activity is good for you and it has numerous health benefits. Um, where that actually comes from, though, is a series of studies which largely uh, were undertaken in the middle and latter half of the 20th century, the first of which was the London Transport uh, Workers Study, sometimes referred to as the London Bus Study. Uh, this was undertaken by Jeremy Morris, who was a very famous Scottish epidemiologist, and it really provided the first epidemiological evidence linking physical activity with uh, negative health outcomes. In particular, this study looked at London transport workers, those who worked in double-decker buses. The uh, primary comparative groups here were the relatively inactive or sedentary bus drivers versus the relatively active bus conductors 
who would go up and down the steps between the top and bottom level of the bus to exchange fares for tickets. Um, so what they generally found with this study was that those sedentary drivers were at a significantly greater risk for myocardial infarction or heart attack than were the conductors, all right? Now that may not seem like earth-shattering science, but at the time, in the early 1950s, there was no epidemiological evidence at all to suggest that physical activity had a benefit. So this was really the first study that demonstrated this. Moving forward a couple of decades to probably the next big jump in our understanding about the health benefits of physical activity, we can look to some of the work that Ralph Poffenbarger, who's another famous epidemiologist, did. Uh, he did work both at Harvard and Stanford over the years. In particular, in this context, he really introduced us to the idea of the dose response. Right? So the more physical activity you accumulate, the greater the health benefit up until a point. And uh, this was done via the Harvard Alumni Health Study with the initial publication back in the late 1970s, I believe 1978. Upon that basis, there have been a whole variety of other prospective cohort studies done over the years, which have expanded upon that initial work that uh, Jeremy Morris and Ralph Poffenberger have done. Um, notable ones in this would include things like the Framingham Heart Study, the Nurses Health Study, uh, and then lesser known studies in this area, the US Railroad Study, and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. For all of these, in general, we were looking at how risks for uh, various chronic diseases, as well as uh, risk for mortality, related to the level of physical activity. Initially, we were really concerned with um, cardiovascular disease and the risks associated with that. Um, and we generally saw a response curve like this, uh, where the relative risk decline uh, across a dosage of physical activity. We'll get to how we kind of translate that dosage coming up. From there, we moved forward to understand how things like stroke were related to that, as well as type 2 diabetes, among a whole host of other chronic disease outcomes that we've studied. And in general, the response curves look quite the same. Now, when we look across the whole, um, what we're ultimately relating here is the dosage of physical activity on the bottom in the units of net minutes per week, where we're multiplying the intensity of the activity by the duration with which it was undertaken. And we get somewhat of bit of a wonky variable, but it's a better exposure to capture both intensity and duration than just duration or intensity by itself. Uh, related to relative risk, though, we can see once we get out beyond about 400 or so, all the way up to 1,000 here, we see a relatively kind of a little bit of a diminishing return in the curve. And the way in which the physical activity guidelines were initially developed was to essentially collate this sort of data and come up with a cut point that corresponded to substantial drop or substantial health benefits such that relative risks for these negative health outcomes um, could be achieved. And what we find is that the point where this occurs is about 500 to 1,000 minutes per week. And when we translate that to something that's a bit more uh, easier to comprehend, that's where we get the 150 minutes of moderate to 300 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic activity. So that's the rough translation there. You certainly can make an argument that it goes down to about 450 if you take three metabolic equivalents, which is moderate intensity, and then multiply that by 150 minutes. Um, you still have significant health benefit at that level. Uh, but in general, this is the range that has been identified from the research that we typically stick to. Uh, and going beyond this confers some additional health benefit. It's not like you can't gain any further benefit, but uh, certainly there's a dramatic drop uh, in relative risk going from no physical activity, zero minutes per week, up to 450 or 500. So that's where we came up with the baseline threshold that we start with. All right, so from that information, we initially saw the development of various recommendations for physical activity from a series of professional organizations with a little bit of mixture of government agencies having a hand in it as well. The first one that was notable was in 1995. It was a recommendation put out by the CDC and ACSM, joint recommendation that stated that every US adult should accumulate 30 minutes or more of moderate intensity physical activity on most, preferably all days of the week. We then saw this more or less reiterated in 1996 in the U.S. Surgeon's General Report, 
which also stated that children should be held to that standard as well, with the language like more or less being verbatim thereafter. Um, of note, we won't really get much into the guidelines for children here. They have changed dramatically from what this recommendation is, pretty much suggesting about twice as much activity as what they're saying here. Um, so something to keep in mind. Lastly, the ACSM AHA guideline expanded upon these previous guidance uh, back in the mid-1990s. This was an update uh, that was uh, authored by Bill Haskell, who's one of the leaders in this field, back in 2007. And what they sought to do was really clarify some misconceptions about the guidelines, most notably this idea about accumulating activity on most, preferably all days of the week. That was a bit of a question mark. What does that mean? Does that mean three days, four days, five days? And from the initial outset, the idea was is that you would be getting 150 minutes in a week of moderate activity or more. So the breakup in frequency to 30 minutes necessitated that it should be five days a week. That was a kind of an error on their part when they were formulating the guideline that they didn't include that explicitly. So the updated guidance more or less says the same thing with additional, um, notif or additional specification that should be done five days per week in terms of moderate or vigorous intense or moderate activity um, and then 20 minutes for vigorous activity which was a, a bit of an addition beyond the further uh, but beyond the previous guidelines specifically laying out what you should be doing for vigorous intensity activity as well for both the Surgeon general report and the acsm aha updated recommendations they did also include recommendations for resistance or strength training twice a week uh, major muscle groups eight to ten exercises that was not in the initial CDC ACSM recommendation, which was almost exclusively focused on aerobic-based activities. All right, so jumping forward from that basis of recommendations, in 2008, we saw the introduction of the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. And these were the first physical activity guidelines that had been released by the US government. Uh, and they're on a 10-year release schedule, so we saw 2008 was the first one, 2018 was the second one, which we'll get to. And the first iteration provided population-based guidelines for three different age groups, children and adolescents, adults, and older adults. In terms of what we'll focus on here, adults is going to be the one where we see the primary changes that are gonna have some impacts in terms of how we interpret the guidelines. So that's going to be our central focus going forward. If we look at the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, specifically for adults, it's broken into four parts. We'll go through each of these relatively quickly. The first one is a general statement to the first part of the guideline to simply say that you should avoid being inactive or not doing physical activity and realize that some activity is better than none. So that was a little bit more explicit than had been stated in previous recommendations to try to promote people to do as much physical activity as they could. Beyond that point, for the second part of the guideline, we went a little bit further and stated what the weekly durations of moderate and vigorous intensity physical activity should be, 150 and 75 minutes respectively. Um, and then also stated that they should be accumulated in episodes or bouts that last 10 minutes or more in duration. All right, so the 150 here roughly corresponds to the 30 minutes per day, five days per week that was specified previously. The change in this case was based upon a re-review of the initial uh, epidemiological evidence that really didn't demonstrate or show that an increased frequency provided any benefit. There was no data to suggest that if you accumulated that 150 minutes in one bolus of activity that that was worse or better than spreading it out over the week. So for that instance, they simply provided an absolute weekly uh, amount. We saw that the vigorous amount of activity that you need to reach the guideline increased from the 2007 ACSM AHA recommendations, which they were saying 20 minutes per day, three times per week, that would be 60 minutes per week. So they bumped that up to 75 minutes per week, generally based upon the idea of trying to equate the benefit of higher intensity and lower intensity activity. In general, the higher the intensity of the activity that you're doing from an aerobic standpoint, the greater the health benefit for a set period of time. Um, so this is basically 
suggesting that for every one minute of vigorous intensity activity that you're doing, you're getting the same benefit as doing two minutes of moderates. And that's what some of the data actually demonstrated. Beyond that, there is also the inclusion of an additional guideline in part three from 2008, where they essentially double the moderate and vigorous thresholds. So if you reach those amounts, uh, you are really knocking it out of the park and doing well, and can experience additional health benefits. And then lastly, uh, there is some guidance about resistance training, muscle strengthening activities, two or more days per week, major, mu major muscle groups. Um, in this case, though, they do not specify exactly how many uh, different sets or reps you need to do. Um, all right, 2008 guidelines in brief. Jumping forward to our most recent guidelines, which just came out last November. Um, they timed it with a couple of conferences around the country. Um, I know, I believe, American Heart Association was the primary one where they did the unveil at this in early November. This is the 10-year update. It is not the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. It's the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans Second Edition, which I don't really know why they discontinued the verbiage. It probably would have been easier to just change the first part. But anyways, they also produce population-specific guidance on physical activity for four different age groups in this case, preschool-age children, children and adolescents, adults, and older adults. And in terms of what was new in particular with this iteration of the guidelines, the first thing we can point to is the inclusion of guidance for physical activity for preschoolers. Right? So they're including ages three to five in this grouping. This uh, had been a bit of a contentious point in the 2008 guidelines development process, whether or not they should include this. Uh, it was felt that they should have back then and didn't, so there was an impetus to include it in this section. We have some professional organizations that have put out some guidance in the past on physical activity in terms of what they should be getting in this age range, um, namely uh, American Academy of Pediatrics as well as uh, Society of Health and Physical Educators. Both of those have some guidance in this area. Uh, this is uh, a bit more, I guess, higher level in terms of coming from um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, although the guidance in and of itself is pretty tame. It more or less just says that you should be, they should be doing activity um, and there's really no specific uh, amount or dosage that, that they actually put out there in terms of the guideline itself. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Hopefully that develops further, but nonetheless, the, this is the first instance of it. All right, we also saw small wording changes to the guidance that we have for children and adolescents. Now, we didn't cover this with the 2008 guidelines, um, but in essence, the changes are pretty minor. The meaning is roughly the same. There's not a lot of difference between the two. When it comes to the guidance that we have for the adults and older adults, though, that's where we've seen some much more impactful changes within the guidelines. For adults and older adults, the guidelines are essentially the same with additional qualification for older adults that they should be doing some work on balance um, while also um, trying to modify their activity should they have any existing ailments or health issues that impede their ability to be active. So we're going to focus on the changes that we see specifically in adults here between the 2008 and 2018 or the second edition of the physical activity guidelines and how that's going to influence the way in which we measure and think about physical activity going forward. All right, so the 2008 guidelines, to go through them quickly, has a prefatory statement similar to the 2008 guidelines. And in this case, they've changed the wording a bit to simply say, don't avoid in it or don't be inactive, but to specifically avoid sitting and to move more they have the same statement about some physical activity is better than none, uh, with some additional verbiage about if you do any amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity, regardless of duration, you're getting some health benefit. Beyond that, for the second part of the guideline, they've sort of collapsed some verbiage from two different parts uh, that were separated in the 2008 guidelines. Now we no longer have uh, a single guideline that says 150 minutes of moderate, 75 minutes of vigorous activity. Now we have one that says 150 to 300 minutes um, or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous. So we've more or less just collapsed it. 
We've also dropped the part about accumulating activity in 10 minute bouts. We'll talk about that going forward, uh, to talk about how that kind of changes the way in which we think about measurement. Um, and then largely everything else is the same. Beyond that, the third and fourth parts, we do see that there's some additional benefit of physical activity beyond 300 minutes per week of moderate to intensity physical activity or an equivalent amount of vigorous. This is the same as what was in um, the previous guidelines. And then the last part is the muscle strengthening guidance, which really hasn't changed either. Now, in terms of the primary changes that we'll look at, there's two that are going to have some pretty dramatic impacts going forward. The first one deals specifically with the prefatory statement, where in 2008 we say all adults should avoid inactivity. Some physical activity is better than none. And adults who participate in any amount of physical activity are gaining some health benefits. 2018, we say adults should move more and sit less throughout the day. Some physical activity is better than none. Adults who sit less and do any amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity gain some health benefits. Now the key here is this whole idea about sitting less. Right, this is based upon the kind of expansion and emergence of sedentary behavior research, looking at health risks of sitting in particular, as well as other sedentary behaviors like TV viewing. Um, in terms of where this comes from, obviously um, there is this emphasis on uh, increasing our awareness of limiting sedentary behaviors, namely sitting, and it's based upon a lot of research which has generally shown uh, this relationship, positive, or positive relationship, such that sedentary behavior is associated with things like instant diabetes and mortality from both cardiovascular disease and all causes. Um, so here's some data uh, from a meta-analysis that was just published uh, not too long ago, last year. And what we have here on the x-axis is sedentary behavior dosage in hours, two hours, the very left, up to 16 hours per day. And uh, we're looking at relative risk here for all-cause mortality. So in comparison to the reference group here at two hours, you can generally see this increasing trend in terms of the risk for all-cause mortality in those who sit more. All right, you've probably heard this. This has been a big uh, kind of saying in the popular culture and in popular media we've seen messages about sitting being problematic and detrimental to your health. You may have heard sitting is death, things like that. Um, it's not quite that simple, but certainly there is evidence to show that there are negative consequences of sitting. The problem is, is we don't have a clear picture of dose response um, issues related to um, sedentary behavior in particular. This sort of information is sort of obscuring a variety of different sedentary behaviors, sitting versus TV viewing. We do know that those particular activities tend to have different health risks, even though TV viewing might comprise a lot of sitting. Um, so it's not entirely clear exactly what the dose response is for this. I and mean, for that reason, the guidelines simply said sit less. It didn't say you need to sit less than so much per day. Um, so. Anyways, moving forward, we hope to improve upon this and actually have some sort of dosing guidance on this to say, you know, no more than four or six hours of sitting. Um, that's hypothetical, I'm just throwing that out there. But we don't have that information yet. In terms of this whole issue of defining sedentary behavior, though, this has sort of kind of exacerbated some of the problems that we have in understanding the dose response issues. I largely centers around this whole term or concept of sedentary. Now, we may think of someone as sedentary who's just, you know, inactive, doesn't do much physical activity. But is that the same as the actual behavior itself of someone sitting who has a very low energy expenditure? And these have been some of the questions we've been struggling with, how we make some of these definitions stick. Um, and we haven't had tons of success, we've had some. Uh, for the longest time, people have simply interchanged words like physical inactivity, physically inactive, sedentary, sedentary behavior. And it's caused lots of problems in coming to come some consensus about how we measure these things, how we uh, define them uh, individually, what have you. Uh, so for that reason, 
Uh, there was a group that was started back in 2011 called the Sedentary Behavior Research Network. Um, I am a member of it, uh, and we have proposed different definitions for these things. Um, we have a most recent definition for sedentary behavior in particular uh, that we've tried to um, put out there such that it's um, used consistently within the literature. Uh, and this is specifically talking about the behavior itself, where we're defining it as anything that's waking, where we have an energy expenditure of less than 1.5 metabolic equivalent, so less than 1.5 times resting energy expenditure, while in a sitting, reclining, or lying posture. Right, so if you are in a sitting, reclining, or lying posture, but sleeping, that doesn't count. So you really have to be waking. Um, nonetheless, um, we still see people kind of use these words all over the place in potentially incorrect contexts. Many of us would argue. Uh, it doesn't stop the papers from getting published, uh, but it has uh, continually led to confusion in this area of research within the field. All right. So questions, though, beyond you know, just semantics about defining sedentary behavior relate to exactly what is the health risk of sedentary behavior and how does that ultimately relate to physical activity or is it related to it? Now, you know, from a general sense, we know that there's only so much time in a day. If you're doing sedentary behavior, um, that's certainly going to potentially displace time that you could be physically active. Likewise, if you're really physically active, you're taking away time with which you could be sedentary. So there's some relationship there. However, much of the initial research uh, generally stated that there, there were independent effects associated with each, such that when you statistically adjust for one uh, in a model-based scenario, you would still see that sedentary behavior carried negative health consequences. Um, this has been explored a bit more thoroughly within the last couple of years. Uh, we have better data um, that we've used to ultimately answer this question. Alf Eklund has kind of been one of the leaders in this field. He's at uh, Norwegian School of Sports Sciences, used to be at Cambridge. Um, fantastic epidemiologist, and he's really uh, kind of parsed this out as best we can with the data that's available. And in general, what the data are showing is that there certainly appears that there is negative health consequences with sitting in particular as a form of sedentary behavior. But that, that uh, negative health consequence can be more or less wiped out or significantly attenuated by a sufficient dosage of physical activity. Um, so what's shown here, um, we have four groups of physical activity, um, was it two point, less than 2.5 mets, um, 16 or met hours per week, um, up to 16 met hours per week, up to 30 met hours per week, and then greater than 35.5 met hours per week here. And then within each one of those physical activity categories, um, we have um, from left to right here the dosage of sedentary behavior. At the bottom, we've got um, less than four hours per day, four to six, six to eight, and then greater than eight. So those are just repeated in each one of those bins. So this grouping over here is the most physically active. And what we see is that this kind of you know, negative trend that we see, we see the hazard ratios here all above one, gets wiped out once we reach really high levels of physical activity here down at the bottom. So if you're doing approximately 36 met hours per week or more of physical activity of a moderate, uh, of either moderate or vigorous intensity, uh, that appears to completely cancel out uh, much of the health detriment associated with sitting. In terms of what that translates into that's a bit more meaningful than met hours per week, one hour of jogging, for most people six days per week, would put you at or slightly above that 36 met hours per week. So one hour of jogging, six days or more per week. Um, that should be enough according to the data here. This has been parsed a bit more by um, the lead author, Alf Eklund. He came out recently um, with an infographic that he's been sharing um, where they looked a little bit more closely at the data and uh, instead of just looking at everything above eight hours, if you pin sedentary behavior at eight hours, it appears that in order to counteract that negative health consequence, you need about an hour of moderate intensity activity per day. 
that will completely wipe out the negative health effects of that sedentary behavior, at least upon uh, the data that they have, which is um, from uh, a series of prospective cohort studies. I believe it's over a million participants in total uh, where that data was in the meta-analysis, so rather large sample. In terms of ways in which you can reduce that sedentary behavior, uh, we've often looked at replacing this uh, in a variety of contexts. Uh, certainly, um, there are a variety of modes to do this. One of the areas that we focus quite exclusively on is you know, sedentary environments in the occupational setting. You think about like the office type work setting. Uh, and I've done a fair amount of research in this particular area. Uh, one of the things that we kind of lose here, though, uh, when we're looking at this is the idea that, yes, it's good if we can have these things like treadmill desks um, or other sort of forms of active workstations, what have you, to raise metabolism while you're working. Uh, the problem, though, is that by themselves, they don't usually reach a moderate or vigorous intensity in terms of their activity level. So you're never at or above three <laughs> metabolic equivalents or three times the resting energy expenditure. And this is where you need to be up in this top range if you're going to count that physical activity as meeting our physical activity guidelines. Not to say that there isn't health benefits here, uh, but it's sometimes overlooked. This sort of stuff, um, treadmill desks for the most part, assuming people are not exercising while they're working, um, is going to be considered light physical activity. If you were up in this range, you would likely be sweating, you would likely be breathing hard, um, you'd be potentially over time a bit more odorous. So there's, there's certainly things to think about, you know, about how realistic that is. Um, I've gotten a lot of pushback in the past when I've made these sorts of statements, but it's, it's true. There's certainly big health benefit overall from what we understand about uh, additional energy expenditure you can have related to physical activity in a given day. Uh, but it's not moderate intensity, which is what our epidemiological evidence supporting the health benefits of physical activity is predicated on. You have to be at that intensity level or above in order to see the benefits with which the guidelines are ultimately based upon. So, John, before you leave that slide, where would you put just standing at a desk? No different than, uh, than sitting. That, there's a lot of stuff that's now standing is not as good as everybody thought. I'm just curious what you. <coughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll slide this in quickly. There's standing doesn't appear to significantly increase energy expenditure above sitting for most people. If you're maintaining the activity the same, if you were typing at this desk sitting, or if I stood you up and had you typing the energy expenditure between the two would likely be quite similar. It might be a slightly bit higher while you're standing. Um, so in terms of health benefit related to energy expenditure, you can't really attribute um, standing to really you know, giving you that health benefit. That said, there are beneficial effects of standing that we don't fully understand why in particularly standing is more healthful than sitting. Um, there's some thoughts, there's some uh, empirical evidence to show increase of uh, lipoprotein lipase action while you're standing as opposed to sitting, which would suggest you'd have uh, more favorable uh, lipid metabolism as a response to standing. Beyond that though, we've kind of been stuck there for like 10 years. So that was a great finding. We haven't really expanded that area at all since then for the most part. Um, there's been some confirmatory research in that area, but that's where we're at. I just saw a job advertisement, and one of the perks of the job is you got a standing desk. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> All right. So in terms of uh, our 2018 guidelines here, there is this significant focus, particularly on sitting, but there's no prescription about, you know, how much sitting you should do in a day or you should go, you shouldn't go over a certain amount. It just says sit less, um, which is certainly simple, but we like having some sort of threshold we can ultimately look at and then bin people where they fall and respect that threshold and then look at what their risks are for various chronic diseases and as such uh, get some sort of idea of what we should be recommending. But we don't have anything like that. Um, interestingly, 
this area of research into the health effects of sedentary behavior um, was at a bit of a crossroads a couple of years ago in 2016, 2017, when they were doing the um, review for the physical activity guidelines, there was a point where there was more meta-analyses in review articles of prospective cohort studies looking at the effects of sedentary behavior than there were original cohort studies. Um, I, I, I don't know why any of the uh, editors didn't care to look to see if similar publications were in any other journals, um, but yeah, there was uh, literally um, and there's literally some of the meta-analysis, you'll look and it's the same studies, they do the same analysis, they'll change a couple of assumptions, uh, and the data generally suggests the same thing, but some of the numbers are slightly different. Uh, so anyways, we had a, a period there where we weren't getting much new data coming in. We've had some additional data since that point, um, and the investigation by Alf Eklund that they showed before was one of them. And what we're suggesting, and we don't have a clear idea of the dose response, but it's become a little bit more clear that once you go at or above eight hours per day of sitting, that's where we tend to see the risks associated with, sit with sitting kind of accelerate in terms of the negative direction. So there's a greater health consequence beyond that threshold. Below it, uh, it appears that the effects are a bit more muted. So our current thinking is that uh, although the guidelines don't necessarily reflect this, you should be trying to limit your sedentary behavior to eight hours or less, and particularly sitting um, more than anything else. That tends to be the thing that we can um, relate to negative health consequences quite easily and quite strongly. Uh, TV viewing falls within that category too, although it's somewhat difficult to disentangle the effects there. We know that people tend to consume food while they're TV viewing too, and if that's getting um, caught up in that, that's not uh, fully understood at this point. We haven't parsed that out. Um, but anyways. John? Yeah. So when we talk about health benefits, is that, does that include or exclude orthopedic benefits from standing versus sitting? That does not include. That does not include orthopedic benefits. So higher levels of standing are associated with increased uh, low back pain, um, and uh, lower body joint dysfunction. So, but some would also say that it's, it's so, but the, but then, positive, you know, saying more, it's, it's kind of yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's sort of uh, working in opposite directions. And there's been not a lot of people who have really married that research to kind of collectively look at those together. Uh, there's one group in Australia that has the expertise in the orthopedic area as well as um, health, who's kind of looked at that a bit more than others, uh, but that's been the general finding. If you stay in too much, you do see increased uh, orth orthopedic issues in response. Uh, so there's some sort of balance there, and their recommendation is where you're constantly changing positions or postures as much as possible. So in the ideal setting, you would be going from sitting to standing every 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and then holding that posture for that time and then transitioning back and forth. Okay. The second primary change I wanted to get to here is uh, dealing with um, the dropping of the bout. So first I'll just show you here, this is the um, kind of fit diagram here, frequency, intensity, time, or duration, and type. Right on the left, we've got the 2008 guidelines versus the 2018 kind of pulled down to the bare bones. The frequency, intensity, and type aspects are all the same. The variety comes at the time portion or duration. So the initial guidelines in 2008 had what was known as the minimal guideline here, as well as the additional guideline. Um, the verbiage between them was slightly different. We more or less just collapsed those into a single set of guidance regarding moderate and vigorous activity uh, in the 2018 guidelines. Um, so that's not a huge change, but certainly simplified things. The bigger issue, though, relates to this part here, this accumulated intended bouts. So we've dropped that from the 2018 guidelines. So we need to talk about where that initially came from. So the 2008 guidelines were based upon largely the 2007 ACSM AHA recommendations, which were based upon the 1995 CDC ACSM recommendations for physical activity. 
Going back all the way to that point, there was recognition in the 1995 guidelines that um, you could, instead of just get all your, getting all your 30 minutes of moderate activity five days per week in individual boluses, you could break that up into 10 minute bouts and get roughly the same health benefits. So that wasn't explicitly stated as part of the recommendation, but they kind of talked about that in the narrative. In 2007, for the ACSA AHA recommendations, they included that within the actual guideline itself, and they said that you should, um, or you can actually break that up into individual bouts if you want, um, of at least 10 minutes or more, and then that carried into the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. And that's based upon a series of randomized controlled trials and controlled studies that have just looked at the difference in terms of health benefit from continuous versus intermittent physical activity. So as an example, the one that they most specifically looked at was a continuous bolus or bout of 30 minutes once a day, five days per week, and then compare that to a program where you go 10 minute sessions three times a day for five days a week. Right? So the total dosage of activity and intensity is the same, you're just breaking it up throughout the week. And what they showed is that when you broke it up into those intermittent sessions of activity, it provided the same level of health benefit in general um, that we saw from just kind of just doing it all at once. So that's where this whole idea of 10 minute bouts came from. The research in that time was limited in that the, the shortest bout that they ever looked at in terms of breaking up a longer bout into shorter bouts, the shortest bout they ever looked at was 10 minutes. So the guidelines said that you should be doing bouts of at least 10 minutes only because the research was limited in that sense. Uh, there also was um, some prospective cohort studies that predate this that actually had asked questions um, and framed it in the sense of assessing physical activity that they had to be doing it in 10 minute bouts. Not entirely clear why that originated, um, but that did occur. Uh, and that partly influenced this interest in these uh, studies looking at um, you know, this intermittent versus continuous bouts of activity, specifically 10 minute bouts in particular. More recently though, we've come to understand that uh, you know, because of that limitation, we shouldn't necessarily just um, think that we only need to have 10 minute bouts, we need to actually get a, a better idea of what the health effects of shorter bouts are. And the evidence is pretty clear that it doesn't matter what the bout length is, there are significant health benefits um, from physical activity accumulated in any bout. Um, at least at a finer resolution as we typically monitor or measure within the research. Uh, so this is shown here in some data which was uh, published just a couple years ago as part of the uh, CARDIO project, Coronary Artery Risk Development in Young Adults. This is looking at uh, accelerometer data in particular where we compare um, risk for incident hypertension uh, among measurements where we count any bout of activity, where we just count any minute um, that's recorded by the accelerometer that's either moderate to vigorous intensity in comparison to when we're specifically looking for 10 minute bouts, which is a bit more restrictive. And in general, the trends are the same. You see, the, you see this inverse trend across tertiles here. So uh, bottom third, middle third, upper third, in terms of level of physical activity, that translates over to the um, second portion here as well. We see the same trend across groupings there. So it doesn't appear that the duration of a bout really matters as much. We can count really any time period. Uh, now there's some, I guess, practical aspects of that, which we'll get to going forward, uh, but part of this impetus, uh, I will say, was fueled by an interest in high intensity interval training or HIIT training and what the health benefits of that are. Um, so primarily, if you look at a lot of those programs, the way in which they're structured, you wouldn't have been able to count those minutes doing HIIT as meeting the physical activity guidelines. The data though, and beyond what I'm showing here, uh, would suggest that that's inappropriate. You should count that towards meaning physical activity guidelines as there is significant health benefit even to things like HIIT training. Um, there's certainly much more that will come forward in the next decade uh, when we reformulate these guidelines again, but nonetheless the evidence is pretty clear at this point. The issue though relates to some of the practical considerations that we have to address when we eliminate <laughs> that particular qualification that you have to do activity and bounce. All right, so if we look 
um, at compliance to physical activity guidelines with national representative data uh, from a couple of surveillance systems here, we can see that we see dramatic changes in the, in the amount or proportion of the population that's meeting the physical activity guidelines. So we have here, um, I'm going to show some data from uh, both the NHANES, which is going to pop up here on the left, uh, as well as uh, BRFIS, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System on the right, that quantifies compliance to physical activity guidelines in the U.S. where we take the data and we apply it to the two sets of guidelines, 2008-2018. Right, so in terms of accelerometer determined physical activity, when we have this 10-minute bout requirement as in the 2008 guidelines, the proportion of adults 18 to 64 who are meeting the guideline is a little above 10 percent, 13 and a half percent. You're talking one in seven, one in eight people. When you drop that bout requirement, just count any old minute, that jumps to 50.6 percent, one in two people. All right. So we literally went from one day in November 2018, where we were still using these guidelines, and this was the compliance rate. We move forward one day and the guidelines change and all of a sudden we have a dramatic increase in the amount of people who are compliant. Um, this is a bit of a question mark, you know, how do we handle this? We'll kind of get back to that later. In terms of self-report data, um, we look back uh, with BRFIS data, we see it's 50.9% according to the 2008 guidelines. And then the 2018 guidelines is a question mark. The reason being is because you cannot, as the guidelines are written, use our most current um, assessment tools for self-reported physical activity across all the surveillance systems to look at compliance to the 2018 guidelines. It won't work. Uh, you can make some assumptions, which might be poor assumptions, uh, but in general they're different. We'll talk about why that is. It's because the self-report instruments in all of those surveillance systems specifically ask about physical activity accumulated in 10-minute bouts or longer. All right, so for the accelerometers, it's quite easy for us to just kind of change the way in which we quantify these things to look at these differences in compliance. Um, whether or not it's appropriate is another question, which we'll get to. Um, for self-report, though, it's not quite as easy. So we'll, we'll move forward to this. We'll come back to this in just a second. In terms of objective monitoring, we certainly can uh, measure physical activity with an accelerometer. Oftentimes we're measuring at 30 to 100 hertz. So we're taking 30 to 100 samples of data every second on someone. Uh, now that's not reasonable that you're going to take one sample and use that as a, a measure of their physical activity. But if you're going to count any bout of activity that's moderate or vigorous intensity towards meeting the guidelines, should there be a minimum requirement? Should it be a minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, five seconds, one second? Um, to me, it seems if it's one second, I do something like this. So if I do that, what, 1,800 times throughout the day, that's 30 minutes of activity. Um, so the question is that is that realistic? Um, you know, and we've kind of already looked at these questions in kids before, because we didn't have this sort of bout criterion in kids. Uh, we didn't have there isn't a consensus on it. In general, the kind of thought is is that when we get below five seconds, you're not really observing behavior anymore. You kind of need to see it for a little. Longer than that, up to five seconds or longer, gives us a better idea of behavior. But in terms of actually quantifying things like compliance to the guidelines, as we look at things like accelerometer data, where we reduce the duration with which activity needs to be completed in order to count it, um, we ultimately see that the proportion of those being compliant increases. So these are 60 second recording intervals here. So this would be quantifying every minute as either moderate vigorous, light, or sedentary. Down here at the bottom is three seconds. So that's every three seconds is either moderate, vigorous, light intensity, sedentary, what have you. And you can see that as you do that, the proportion of those who are compliant to the guidelines increases. And so does the total amount or duration of time that would be counted as higher intensities, moderate and vigorous would increase as well. Um, so we've addressed this in kids Largely, we opt for 15-second recording intervals in many cases with these devices. The reason why we've opted for that is partly because kids 
physical activity, especially younger kids, is much more intermittent uh, or uh, sporadic in nature, including lots of starts and stops that may get masked with kind of broader recording intervals. Uh, so that's why we've gone for uh, that kind of narrower window in that case. In terms, though, of the self-report questionnaires, these questionnaires really are in dire need of revision considering the changes that we've seen with the guidelines. All right, so our primarily surveillance systems in the U.S. that are tracking physical activity um, are um, NHIS, uh, BRFSS, and, and Haynes. Uh, so the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System and National Health Interview Survey both have physical activity questionnaires that are used um, to assess self-reported physical activity. And Haynes has self-reported physical activity as well via questionnaire, as well as um, objective monitoring that they do about every eight to 10 years for two cycles. Uh, all of them, though, have assessed physical activity with questions that predicate that you're doing this for at least 10 minutes in duration. So as a sample question from NHIS, for instance, uh, and excuse the all uppercase caps here, that's just how it, it's verbatim from the actual questionnaire. Uh, how often do you vigorous, or how often do you do vigorous leisure time physical activities for at least 10 minutes that cause heavy sweating or large increases in breathing or heart rate? So all of the questions from these surveillance systems have this hidden within it, at least 10 minutes. All right, our guidance, our guidelines no longer have that. Uh, so just kind of blindly applying this data to our current guidelines presents some problems uh, in that context. So the question is, where do we go from here? In terms of the sedentary behavior research, we need a lot more um, high quality research that specifically parses out sitting versus um, TV viewing time versus other forms of sedentary behavior and their health outcomes. Some of those studies are in the way there's certainly um, room for other studies to join the trend though and look at uh, some of these questions. Um, and they should specifically be kind of designed to try to avoid some of these issues with sedentary and how we define it. So the more specific we can get at given activities, the better uh, to give us a kind of a holistic picture of what the risks collectively of sedentary behavior are. Um, and in terms of what this will allow us to do, hopefully uh, we'll be able to make some more informed prescriptions related to sedentary behavior in terms of what the duration is that you should avoid. Uh, ultimately, that's, I think, where we're headed. Uh, there have been some uh, prescriptions like this in other countries. Canada, uh, for instance, um, has one where they, they talk about um, not uh, doing bouts of sedentary behavior for 60 minutes or more. Um, and I think specifically they focus on sitting. That's more or less just a, a, a throw up point that they literally threw up on the board and picked out of, out of thin air. Right? Talked to the individual who came up with it and uh, they said they needed a starting point. They have enough data to show the negative health consequences of sedentary behavior. It's up to other people to refine our dose response understanding to give us a better idea of what we actually should be doing. Um, so anyways, that's where we leave sedentary behavior sitting research. In terms of the elimination of the bout criteria, we really need to have a better understanding of how bouts of activity of varying time durations affect health. We don't have that currently. We're still somewhat limited. In terms of the data that was used to ultimately justify dropping the 10 minute bout requirement, the vast majority of it was a large number of cross-sectional studies and then a handful of pretty well designed and controlled prospective cohorts. We need more of those prospective cohorts as well as randomized control trials to parse out uh, those issues a bit more. And that will allow us, hopefully, if, the, if it remains true, the trend remains true, to justify further why we do not need that bout criteria um, or any minimum duration for physical activity. And then uh, lastly, we really need to revise our instruments that we're using to assess physical activity because of these changes. Uh, in particular, um, the objective monitoring technologies, we need to know how or what interval is too short to be meaningful. So, you know, the little step that I did, which was less than a second, if we do 1,800 of those in a day, is that meeting the guidelines or do we need to be going for at least a minute um, or more? Those are questions we need to answer. 
And then lastly, related to the self-report measures, we really need new questionnaires where we're evaluating the properties of them to see if they can adequately capture physical activity via a self-report measure uh, without qualification about a 10-minute bout criteria. We just don't have that. Uh, and we certainly can stay the course and use the same instruments. Uh, I actually have not heard lots of discussion yet about what the plan is. There's a lot of people that are aware of these issues, but there's no concrete um, plan going forward about how we're going to address them uh, to make sure that we can still use some of these measures. People rail on self-report metrics quite often, and there's some deservedness for that. Uh, still, self-report physical activities pretty highly related to health outcomes, right? And there's lots of data to support that. It tends to not be of the same quality or of the same strength as much of the objective data, but trends in the same direction. Um, and we have lots and lots of data to support that. So it's been replicated many times. All right. In terms of acknowledgments, uh, certainly want to thank my OSU collaborators here. We've had various inputs with who are thinking through. I've had some input on uh, what I ultimately put forward here, as well as my students, and then some external collaborators that I work with as well. And I will take any questions. I have one. Uh, so, when the guidelines come out, considering that the idea is that we get them out to everyone, it should be you know, knowledge for the general public, we want people to be active. We know that most adults do not even remotely close, come close to meeting physical activity guidelines, um, cardiovascular or resistance training. So what are, what are some thoughts on, you know, we're looking at 18 to 64 year old adults. These are working people, parents, kids, they, you know, when they see, I need to do 30 to 60 minutes a day, well, I'm not even gonna bother. So how does, I mean, where do we go to like increase self-efficacy so people can actually meet the guidelines and is there any way to write them in such a way that, you know, yes, sit less, but make it so people will do it. We need to actually get more people to move in general. Understanding those points, I think that's been a lot of the impetus behind looking back at occupational physical activity mm -hmm. and energy expenditure because of any of the individual components, whether it be leisure time or occupation, typically the research has shown that the vast majority of decline in physical activity for the general population has actually been from the occupational setting, um, particularly in adults. Uh, and that's largely via redistribution of work within the US where we see fewer and fewer people employed in goods producing manufacturing jobs, mm -hmm. logging, farming, uh, other sorts of manufacturing that typically in the past had higher levels of energy expenditure uh, and more physical activity. You can argue that automation has crept into that um, and potentially displace some of that physical activity. Um, and there's certainly uh, a rationale for that, not a lot of empirical evidence to show that. Um, and then we've seen that displaced population then largely employed more so in service jobs where they're typically more physically inactive, uh, not meeting the guidelines, and they're largely engaged in sedentary behaviors. Uh, so the, the point is, is that I think a lot of the research has looked, you know, more recently has been trying to think um, about what can we do in terms of environmental maximization in the workplace setting to try to drive some of this um, beyond uh, you know, individual behavior change models, which I mean, it still goes on, but uh, you know, specifically geared at getting people more motivated to be physically active. Um, I don't have a great answer for you on that, and that's you know, curious, a yeah. question. I, I guess part of that comes from too with, you know, since it's involved, you know, with the, with the ACSM, you know, one thing that happened recently, you, I mean, we talked about this a year ago, the Park U was changed to make it so that it, there was a lower barrier to exercise for people. Yeah. And so is there a way to do that with our PA guidelines, too, to help people to feel more I, they, you know? they, they tried to do that. I mean, the, the, the guidance is certainly simplified. So some of the guidelines is based upon the old ACSM guidelines for exercise testing prescription, where they give individualized fit prescriptions for healthy adults, older adults, uh, those post-MI in cardiac rehab, those who are uh, post-stroke, what have you, they've got all these sorts of guidance. And the guidelines and that, um, those individual recommendations share the same underpinning epidemiological data. Um, and a lot of the same people have worked on both of those. So they've 
that's been a cognizant thing to take those, which tend to be a bit more dense, the ACSM recommendations, yeah. and to simplify them. It may not be perfect. That's been their attempt. I think more broadly, dissemination is perhaps an issue with us. I don't know, you know, from a marketing standpoint, how tied in our public health service is for these things. Um, with you know, conversing with some of my colleagues in Canada and Australia, it tends to be a bit more catchy there in terms of them being able to get this sort of information out. I don't know, you know, what the public health impact of that is, but. It, it, they tend to have a, a bit easier route, it seems. Cool, thank you, that's interesting. Other questions? Uh, if you think from a marketing and motivational standpoint, and let's just say we get better at talking to them, then an inherent risk trying to break it down like, as small as possible, like this is this black sex, just admit it, you know, fun. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. Um, you know, that's part of the hit thing is to you know, just get as much activity as you can in a short duration of time, and that's all you need. Um, interestingly, we didn't go into it here because we didn't have time, but if you look at the studies which have, which have evaluated these hit programs, uh, the total energy expenditure that you get from them is typically the, you know, and this is a, a, a couple of different studies that have been pooled, and they compare it to expected energy expenditure for doing moderate activity 150 minutes a week, so meeting the minimum guideline. The HIT training typically is only putting you at about 65 to 70% of the energy expenditure, so the protocols themselves need to be increased in duration slightly, even though they're really intense, in order to meet the same level of energy expenditure if that's the exposure we want to track. So that's one of the minutia points for the, in there uh, that hasn't really made it out there yet, but uh, that's something that people have been looking at too. Just a um, quick question. Um, with the large data sets, do you see any plans for them to move to some of these, uh, to the uh, more objective measures than the old surveys that you're referring to? Um, in the U.S., Yes and no. I mean, NHANES just continually does their you know thing every you know because eight to ten years, and they they have a subset that's running around measuring instead of you reporting your weight. Couldn't we add this as well as something a little bit more objective? Yeah, you you would think so. Um, interestingly, though, not a lot of others have done it as well. So I know in the UK, the um, uh, England. Health Survey, I believe is what it's called, is their equivalent to NHANES. They have done some physical activity stuff, but it's been intermittent like us. Um, the Canadian Health Measures Survey has probably been the most consistent, um, although they recently had a break in their data collection. I think the reasoning is that the, the workload and manpower, both from manpower as well as a monetary standpoint that goes into doing that, far exceeds the um, self-report stuff and I'm not you know it's certainly it's better data and I would advocate for it but there's only so much of a stomach for it so I can give you an example here so when the 2003 2004 um, NHANES went that was the first time they put an accelerometer on people to measure their physical activity in a nationally representative um, surveillance system type survey when they got done with that the accelerometer data that you could download from their website was larger than all of the other data sets they had collected from the laboratory measures, the surveys, everything else combined, and much, much larger. And at the time, there was, they had all sorts of issues with hosting the data and making it publicly available because of that size. Uh, and now, with the scale we've achieved since then, that data, it's, it's a joke. But we do run into the most recent data collection from NHANES, in particular, which was 11, 12, and 13, 14, those two cycles. Um, the data in total are about 10 terabytes in size, and it was risk warning accelerometry in roughly 10,000 people. And there are some issues they're having with hosting. There's also issues with um, confidentiality fears breaches, which I think are unfounded, they're convinced, some people are, that you can take machine learning, artificial intelligence, which you probably hear about, 
and you could actually train it on the, the person and you'd be able to see them writing their name. You could literally trace the acceleration signal and back and you could plot it out and you could find out their names and then you could then figure out who it is. So that would be a breach of confidentiality. And that seems like a lot of steps to me. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues uh, who are uh, mathematicians and um, statisticians in this area have um, testified at um, NIH in reference to this uh, to say that, that you know, like the t we're just not there, the technology is not there. Um, and even then, it's on their non dominant hand, so they probably aren't doing a whole lot of writing with their non dominant <laughs> hand. Uh, but nonetheless, those have been some of the concerns, and there's there's just more of those things that pop up where with the, the questionnaire, it's an interviewer who's just saying, you know, let me ask you this question, and then you lots of response. Recall, you've got I know, I know, there's all, there's all, all sorts of issues with that that are problematic, but that's, um, they opt for that, unfortunately. Yeah, we got the same diet thing wrong. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.